All right, uh, we'll go through these three new releases real quick uh, on top of uh, the Netflix video that's coming tomorrow. So once again, we're still in the award season, so we're going to cover one of those and then go back uh, forward to movies that came out this new year. Um, so let's go ahead and start back in 2017 with Molly's Game, which uh, hopefully my memory is okay because I saw it back uh, all the way back to Sunday. So, it should be not quite as fresh as it usually is, but uh, we'll see. Um, and for a little, obviously the first thing that really got this movie attention was the fact that it was going to be what is, I believe, Aaron Sorkin's directorial debut and yet another one of his scripts um, based on Molly Bloom's book. And I know people were, even though it was a new Sorkin project, was which is typically exciting, some people were really dismissive of it, saying it's going to be just him singing praises to his ex-girlfriend or something, something like that. Um, people always need a reason to tear down something before they've even laid eyes on it. I guess this was one of those. Um, so, and obviously it was another big, juicy part for uh, Jessica Chastain. And I, I've been critical of uh, Chastain lately, as we know, with the likes of uh, Zero Dark Thirty and Miss Sloan, and where these parts where I just think they don't... I didn't really feel like they were... Fit, I don't know if necessarily if it's they weren't fit for her, but that she couldn't quite make the roles believable. Um, like, they almost seemed a bit too powerful for her. So, like I said with Miss Sloan, like, I felt like somebody like Sandra Bullock would have had a lot more command over the role. Um, but here, it, it, she she does have a much better hold on it than I think she did in movies, and similar performances, like Zero Dark Thirty and Miss Sloan and all that. You might say it might be a bit of typecasting, but um, I do think this is uh, one of the few times where she actually has really felt like she owned a role like this for once, entirely. Um, obviously she has moments in those other roles, but this is one where it felt really consistent. Um, and it starts off immediately with the fact that a good, good chunk of her performance here, actually, even though she's on screen for pretty much the whole time, um, obviously a good chunk of her performance is going to be the narration. So it's like, you're just like, like if you love Chastain, you would love this because you are just bombarded with her. Like she's, she's always there. She's constantly talking on screen, but it's also, she has a narration that rivals De Niro and Casino. Um, where, like, Casino is a three-hour movie, and it's, like, almost that whole time you can just hear De Niro's voice and voiceover as to more, pr probably more so than we actually hear him speak in the movie itself. Um, and that's kind of what Chastain is doing here, and you would think for a movie that is two hours and 20 minutes that that would get a bit tiresome, but at the same time, if you do think that, either you're not an Aaron Sorkin fan or you don't know who Aaron Sorkin is. <laughs> so, um... The thing here is, it, when it starts off, it does kind of seem like, um, like it, it, it felt a little bit kind of on the line of, do you know what you're doing or do you not know what you're doing in the event that uh, we see her in this whole uh, skiing prologue where she's telling us about this injury that she faced, which takes us back to her childhood, which has led up to this point, and it's this whole big giant ordeal in this opening, and then obviously she has this massive injury, and this scene ends with her telling us in the narration, more, I'm obviously paraphrasing, but more or less, by the way, this has nothing to do with the rest of the story whatsoever. This is simply an introduction. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I can see where that might seem like a questionable idea, and I typically kind of try to call out some movies that have done this before, where I say, just because you call it out doesn't necessarily make it work by itself. Um, but it does, when we see this character and how kind of st strong, for, back, for lack of a better word, that she is throughout it, um, it does actually, it does in a sense serve a purpose, for sure. It definitely introduces us to her as a character and kind of gives her that whole, no matter how much she takes a beat down, she quite literally many times, um, she's likely going to bounce back because that's just, that's just the character. So I do think... Well, yeah, in regards to story-wise, not so much, but it does eventually have a purpose. On top of the fact that I know some people... I heard some criticism that people think the Costner scenes are a bit shoehorned in, and that he... Sorkin has been having this thing about um, 
parent-child relationships kind of being forced into the narrative of his scripts, like with Steve Jobs, obviously, and um, Brad Pitt's daughter in Moneyball. And I, I don't know. Honestly, it wasn't until somebody pointed it out I even realized that was a trend in his work. Because um, they really fell in with like that was a big chunk of Steve Jobs's story and his whole character arc and in Moneyball it's just kind of this nice consistent thing I don't think it's out of place in any of the movies I don't really think it's out of place here either um because it really a lot of where her strength comes from is kind of shown to us in these Costner flashbacks and then in one of the more kind of emotional scenes and certainly some of the most emotional stuff we've seen Kevin Costner do lately much as I loved uh, black or white, not many people saw that, unfortunately, but, um, yeah, that scene towards the end when they're on the bench is, I think, one of the, think one of the really kind of big moments that kind of brings it all together, sort of like, it's sort of like her, it's sort of like Costner's Michael Stilberg and Call Me By Your Name moment, uh, this scene is, and I, I honestly think it all does work in context, even though I do think that criticism probably comes from the fact that that is in the final stretch of the movie, and the movie's almost two and a half hours, so I can see people maybe getting a little antsy when, by the time that comes around. Um, but yeah, talking about it, and I was talking about um, the, st the style kind of reminded me of uh, De Niro's narration in Casino. So when you see her narrating, and we're going through all this, we see like the, the poker games and all that, and we see how everything has come together. You're kind of thinking, oh, so it's going to be it's basically trying to be Scorsese and it's kind of like kind of like when David O. Russell did American Hustle and it's like well, this is clearly David O. Russell trying to do Scorsese to the point that it's annoyingly obvious um but the interesting thing about this is that I also kind of talked this uh, talked about this when I was talking about uh Taylor Sheridan uh doing Wind River where it's like my concern was is it gonna be more like like when you look at say um, Steve Jobs or Moneyball or The Social Network and you see like Fincher, Bennett Miller, um, Danny Boyle and it's like so is he are we gonna kind of just see like little tones of them throughout like kind of a mesh of the directors he's worked with kind of like when I was talking about that have directed his scripts uh, kind of like when I was saying was I was afraid One River was gonna be like half Dave McKenzie half Danny Villeneuve and but once again, just like we didn't have that problem with Sheridan, he was able to kind of make it his own thing, and we kind of felt like it was coming from those worlds, but from his own point of view and not necessarily from the directors he'd worked with before. Um, there was never... Not only do we not have that problem with Sorkin, where it does kind of feel Sorkin throughout it, but that's the thing, is that what Sorkin had in his favor that Taylor Sheridan didn't really have quite the resume for yet was you don't really count on there being Sorkin say like Molly's game might may look a little like social network may look a little like Moneyball or Steve Jobs um because a Sorkin style already exists even if it's a writing style still it's a very prominent very famous very recognizable style and that's exactly what Molly's game feels like it doesn't feel like anybody else's movie but his um so, once again, from a first-time directing standpoint, that's that was a very important thing to kind of get past, and, of course, he did just fine. Um, and another thing about that, as well, is that, obviously, his movies tend to have that flow to them. They always have, if you have If your movie is an Aaron Sorkin script, there's a good chance that the editing is going to be a huge asset to the movie. Like, it's going to be one of the most praised things about it, because that's just, how else do you handle his writing... Um, and the great thing they really do here is, uh, I, I guess this is a writing standpoint too, it depends on how the script was put together, but, uh, the fractured timeline really works well for this movie and really does the, like, like, honestly, I can't imagine this movie in chronological order. It would probably feel real, not, and that's not to say that it's not a totally interesting story throughout, but I do think it's infinitely more interesting that we're doing the Fracture Timeline than if we saw it in chronological order, for sure. Sometimes that kind of just seems like a gimmick to do... I, I don't know. It, but um, to kind of go with a trend, I guess. But here it really kind of enhances how much we're invested in it. Because just when we get enough of this, then we cut back to this. And they give us just enough of each one for just the right amount of time to where we're engaged almost constantly. 
Uh, I do think it starts to lose interest. I mean, I can't... Obviously, being real life, it's kind of hard to say. Like, you, you can't just say, well, I've lopped this whole portion off. Because it's like, if people know the real story, it's like... Well, that's weird you tell the first half of the story and not the second, because there's a whole whole big picture here. But just in regards to, in general, a storytelling perspective, whether it's real or not, I found myself much more interested in the game aspect of it than, say, when uh, the Russian mob or whatever started getting involved. Then it's kind of like, uh, well, the second half, it's still strong, but it's not near as strong as it was in the first half, where our main focus was the game and its players. Because um, the movie definitely has a lot of interesting characters that we go into that kind of enrich in their, their own portions of the story. Like, the uh, one that really stands out is the, that little side story with Bill Camp. Um, and just having characters like that in this that kind of, like I said, it we're still here. We're never quite branching off into a totally different thing. But they hear just enough with their own thing going on that it's it keeps everything lively and keeps our interest going in different directions, but without losing us. Obviously, somebody that's going to really stand out is Michael Sarah. Not necessarily just because it's Michael Sarah playing a part like this, but there's the whole thing that um, he's like, I don't. <laughs> it's like they didn't know what they were. I guess. Obviously, for legal reasons, they can't quite say. They even do the kind of clever thing when uh, he goes to introduce himself, and just before he says his name, it just cuts to like red carpet footage to show that he's a famous actor. And it's like, oh yeah, but we've read into it all. We've all read into it enough that uh, we know he's Tobey Maguire. There's <laughs> like, like there's we've heard the stories for a long time, um, and so the interesting thing about it was I do like Sarah in this. And it's not necessarily that it's a little distracting. It's just that I can't really say much about Sarah's performance because I don't know about anybody else that already knew this going in, but it's like all I wanted to do was imagine the real Tobey Maguire <laughs> in this scenario every time I saw Michael Sarah. I guess it helps that it was easy to do that while looking at Sarah, um, even though like they kind of... I suppose they kind of somewhat share that meek quality to them that is they're known for, obviously, in movies. Clearly not in real life, but, um, yeah, so I did find that, uh, very interesting, even though that's probably the last thing Tobey Maguire and his legal team want us to do when we watch this. Um, I just couldn't help it. And then thinking about those scenes when he says, um, when she basically is asking him why he plays and why he's so obsessed with winning when he's, uh, fam they didn't quite go into this, but famous franchise actor, <laughs> Um, and just with a real nonchalance, it's just like, I don't play because I want to get rich. I play to ruin people's lives and take, and just take the money from them. Doesn't matter if I have it. It's the fact, basically the fact that they don't is what he's saying. Um, and it's like, wow, what a piece of shit. And he plays that so well. <laughs> um, and that's, once again, though, once we get to the second half of the story and he's gone and that whole thing has evolved into something else then I wasn't near as into it as I once was. Um, but it still keeps interest by cutting back to the scenes with Idris Elba when they're going through all the legal stuff. And it's not its not afraid to have a sense of humor. I like the, uh, just, just little things in there that don't mean anything like that. When they're sitting in court and they have to keep doing the switching places thing. Uh, it's just funny in itself. Um, and yeah, he doesn't, I don't recall any particular big scenes, but Elba does everything he needs to do just fine, as Idris Elba does. Um, and then there is, um, there is also, um, another movie with Graham Greene in it, speaking of Wind River, um, and the, the reunion with him and Costner. Uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, like I was talking about before, um, the, I feel like the Costner story's fine. I don't, I don't think it makes it too bloated. I think it's obviously very important to the growth of her character, and it shows us how she kind of was motivated all the way back from her youth to get to this point because of him. I can't quite fathom where people think this is kind of shoehorned in, so... Um, that's perfectly fine. And then they, obviously, throughout, we're going to have these awesome bits of dialogue, where even if they're, like, obviously in the Sorkin way, even if there's just, like, a random anecdote in here that only makes somewhat of a relevant point to what it's involved in in the story here, uh, like the Matthew Robinson story, 
is like this whole thing. I guess especially if you don't know the history, it's like, whoa, I had no idea. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and obviously, all a lot of that comes through because of Chastain's perfect delivery, because that's the whole thing to where it's like, uh, I was saying this about Jonah Hill getting an Oscar nomination for Moneyball, and people are like, why? And it's like, well, yeah, it may seem like he's just there, but I mean, having to do Sorkin dialogue without tripping over yourself is like a whole thing. Like, there's like, that in itself is the performance. If you go, if actors go above and beyond that, that's just the cherry on top. The fact that they can do the Sorkin dialogue and get it out smoothly, that's like 90% of what the performance needs to do. Everything else is just extra fun. So, uh, <laughs> that's always, um, that's always a plus when they can do that. And, once again, Chastain has to do that for a straight 220, pretty much without stopping. Uh, so, that definitely brings something to the movie that was absolutely going to make or break it. And, it's one of those cases where it's kind of hard to imagine. Like I said, I could see Bullock doing Miss Sloan. I can't really imagine somebody else here. Uh, now that I've seen Chastain do it, so, um, that's always good. And, of course, we talk about the Sorkin dialogue and all that, and the way it works. And it's like, every now and then, there's kind of a, there's a risky line in here where, um, the line is said, uh, you really get a kick out of yourself, don't you? And it's kind of like, that's a really dangerous thing for Aaron Sorkin to say, to make somebody else say, with his dialogue. Um, but Aaron Sorkin's a guy that can get away with that. And it's like, well, it doesn't matter if Sorkin gets a kick out of himself, because surely most of us do, too. So, uh, yeah, so, like I said, not completely and entirely engaging from start to finish, but being 220, more often than not, that's likely. But, um... Still, um, very, a lot of very strong stuff going on, a really nice, uh, like I said, just watching Sorkin kind of come out in his way from a directorial standpoint and able to still keep his style in line and to where you don't see any, you can't imagine anybody else's name on this, um, to have just solely been writing for so long is, uh, is an accomplishment in itself, so, uh, yes, I do think that's a very good. Um, the second movie is gonna be 12 Strong. Um, it was, like, pitch black in the theater, and it isn't usually. So everything I wrote here is, like, completely unreadable. So I will do my best to bring these thoughts back together. I can't guarantee they're going to be cohesive, but I will try to get them out there. So, um, 12 Strong is yet another movie, kind of like, um, I was having flashbacks to, uh, uh, 13 Hours a little bit and <laughs> from, what was that, last year? Last year, but oh, about two years ago, because it came out in January, like this. Um, and it was kind of one of those cases of, this was a really odd thing to me. Because, like I said, it seemed like just another kind of random military movie that won't get a whole lot of attention, will appeal to a certain crowd, but then just kind of disappear into the abyss. And then it's like, well, Chris Hemsworth's the star of it, and it's like, well, all right... Um, but then you've got, like, Michael Shannon and Trevante Rhodes, the star of Moonlight, <laughs> and then you're like, okay, um, maybe there's something interesting here, um, just based on the cast alone. I can say, I basically chose to see this over Den of Thieves strictly because of Michael Shannon. Um, and Trevante Rhodes, too, has me interested now. Um, so, when it starts off, we do see that... There's gonna be a lot of cliches. The opening scene is basically the opening scene of Deepwater Horizon. We have Hemsworth at home uh, with his wife and his kid, and he's doing the dad thing, and then we know that something awful is going to happen because the opening is basically a countdown to 9-11, and we're just waiting for that to happen, and then it's marked that this is that morning when everybody's being happy and with their family and all that, and then shit's about to get real, and they're gonna get shipped off to do whatever it is William Fickner wants them to do. So, um, and there's always going to be that question of, is this going to be one of those America Fuck Yeah movies um, that we get so many of? And sometimes sometimes they hit really hard. Sometimes they kind of totally lose their meaning in there. It's kind of like, kind of like 13 Hours did. 
Uh, so, and this isn't this isn't quite Michael Bay or anything. I mean, the presence of Michael Shannon and William Fickner might make you think that, but uh, no, it's it's not quite like that. But um, it does feel a lot like very retread territory, despite the fact that we're telling a story that hasn't been told in movies yet. And that's that's always kind of off-putting when you really do a disservice to a story like that. Um, where you take these stories that are really great stories that really should be told, but you kind of just make them look like everything else. It's like, there is no reason whatsoever I should be confusing this in 13 hours, because they are so... the stories themselves are so on, like, different pages, and the execution of the movies in general, but still, it happens because they can't seem to just make things not blend together. They can, it's, there's hardly a unique thing here. Uh, regardless of the story itself, I know there's just going to be instant brownie points regardless because of the story itself and because it really happened and because these were real people. But, I mean, the makers still have to do something about that. They have to put it to the screen and not just rely on that, of course. Um, so we have Hemsworth, and there's this office setting... And he's obviously resented by the other guys like Michael Pena and the other group because they're out there doing God knows what. They're in, you know, lakes and swamps and shit, like planes flying over. And he's stuck behind a desk um, under a roof and all that stuff. So finally, Hemsworth's going to make sure he proves himself and gets them like the best assignment ever. Uh, or at least it's shit. <laughs> or at least um, a very crucial one. Sorry to make you seasick there for a second. Um... And the thing here is that once they go on this mission, obviously, it's kind of like... Well, there are definitely interesting things in here. Kind of like um, the whole story with the guy that Hemsworth ends up becoming friends with. Uh, the guy that they have to team up with. is like probably the most fleshed out character in the movie. And he's not one of the main characters. He's not, he's not one of the main guys. He's not one of the twelve. And of course, you know going in, they're not going to flesh out all the twelve by any means. Um, but you would expect him to flush out at least a few of them. <laughs> but, um, unfortunately, not really. And the thing is, is that maybe you at least give them character types. Now, of course, that's definitely something that's going to get criticized should it happen. But it's like, when you see how they handled them in this movie, it's kind of like, well, if they had at least done ter character types, I could tell them apart. But <laughs> I, I don't know. I know, like, um, I know Thad Loganwell, the actor term producer, who's now back to acting, is somewhere in there. Taylor Sheridan was in there. He just keeps coming back. Uh, <laughs> end of the story. Um, but even so, it's like, Michael Shannon was strictly Michael Shannon. Trevante Rhodes was strictly Trevante Rhodes. Michael Pena was strictly Michael Pena. The other guys were those other guys. There was the blonde one. There was the glasses one. It was like Arliss Howard in Full Metal Jacket or something. <laughs> and that's and then that's how we're dealing with the rest of it. And then after a while, we just get a bunch of war scenes. And it's like, you just don't really feel much of anything. Like, there's not even real... It's not even so much that they attempt, like, some emotional moments or some real character work and it just doesn't work. It doesn't even seem like there's an attempt. There's just this redundant middle ground where it's just kind of them being here. And then after a while, explosions start happening. And there's really nothing in between that makes us say, oh shit, explosions are happening. Just, oh, there's the explosions I figured were coming eventually. Um, and there's just nothing. I just felt, I felt absent watching this. <laughs> like, I, I felt like I was half there in the theater, by no means in the setting, uh, only in the theater, and it's like, and even even when it's like trying to have a sense of humor about itself, it just kind of feels like that. It feels very much like low tier scenes from the Bigelow movies, like the like low tier versions of the scenes in Bigelow's movies. Like remember when um, when in Zero Dark Thirty, when Joel Edgerton and Chris Pratt are just playing horseshoes and shooting the shit and talking about what they're gonna do. Or there's, like, um, the scenes where the Brotherhood gets stronger and the Hurt Locker, and they're, like, doing horseplay and all that stuff, giving each other their backstories and all that. It's like, those scenes are in this, but they mean nothing. They're just here for, like, filler. And then, 
And talk about filler, there's even scenes that feel like deleted scenes. There's a scene where Tervante Rhodes has to take a piss, so he's walking off, and this kid's, like, following him. And it's for a laugh, I guess, but the scene ends, and that doesn't matter. I, that kid is, like, kind of supposed to be important to him, kind of like the way the DVD kid in The Hurt Locker was to Renner. Um, but no, just not the same vibe at all whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> there's this, it's like, oh, yeah, these characters are here. But it's like, oh, so much of this movie feels like deleted scenes. And then I was talking about, like, they try to have a sense of humor with the way they interact and all that. And it's like, there was an older couple directly in the seats next to me. Like, right next to me. And every time, like, a little one-liner or a little joke or whatever would happen, they would laugh. And it's like, I didn't want to... And there were quite a few people in the theater in general. So it's like, I don't want to seem like a douchebag that's just, you know, sitting there like this while everybody's laughing. So it's like... I would throw out the pity laughs. Like, I would say, like, the, yeah, you know, that's funny. I'm glad you guys are having a good time. But it's like, every time I did that, it felt more forced than the last time. And it actually started to make me uncomfortable even doing it. It's like, maybe I'd be more comfortable seeming like the douchebag that doesn't like anything to these people that I don't know. Uh, but it's, I'm just that self-conscious about what people think of me, I guess. So, um, and that, and so that, that kind of sucked. And then it's, um, but I mean, obviously there is, <laughs> there is some reality in this movie, but not from the places you would think. And certainly, <laughs> like, um, like the, the opening scene, the Deepwater Horizon opening, when Hemsworth is at home, I believe that's his real life wife, Hemsworth's wife, Elsa Pataki, playing his wife in this. So it's like, okay, so there's a little reality there when you feel there, when you see them and know that there's a real life love there. And it's like, okay, so I guess through that, I can feel, you know, the pressure of what he's about to do and how it strains this love that they have and how much this is going to hurt when they have to part ways, I guess. And then there's, like, another thing that kind of throws a little bit of reality into it was, um, this is actually kind of cool, um, the fact that Rob Riggle is in this. And that, and well, for starters, I'll say that, um, obviously, if you read up on it or you heard him talk about it, the dude that he's playing is the dude that he, uh, was, like, his superior when he was in the military himself. I don't know how many people realize that Rob Ray was in the military. He just, he just kind of looks like it. Uh, you should get that. But, yeah, the fact that he's known for all these comedies and stuff like that, you would think it'd be weird seeing him in a movie like this, even if you know his military background, but it's like... No, he actually really fits into this environment well. It's like, I want to see him do drama. I want to see him do straight drama, like, all the time. I mean, not that he does anything here that's, like, you know, outstanding or anything, but, I mean, it's just, like, the fact that he can... We know him for those parts, and then he can come in here and play it totally straight, and we just believe it immediately, whether that's real life bleeding in or not, um, is good. Because, yeah, like I said, with all the over-the-top stuff, like, this is... He's in, like, 21 Jump Street and The Hangover and shit like that. And it's like that he... Yeah, you would think he would stick out, and he totally doesn't. So I did like that. Um, but it is obviously one of those movies where it's going to be like... Um, like I was talking about how with people are barely being flushed out here. Obviously, we're gonna, we are going to try to hit those emotional points like we often do in movies like this when the explosions and the guns are going to start going off and people are going to start getting get, to get picked off. But there is a lot in these scenes. There is a lot of people getting shot and going down. And you keep trying to get a look at them. Like, which guy was that? Did I see him earlier? And it's like, oh, shit. I saw that guy in an earlier scene. But what was he doing? I don't remember. <laughs> it's that kind of stuff uh, when we get towards the end. And everybody, you know, our background guys are getting picked off. <laughs> um, so so once again, that's uh, that kind of sucks. But then we get... Uh, yeah, just in general, like I said, you would think a story like this, you could tell it in a way that's really memorable and really helps these guys shine, because that's the whole point of telling it. Uh, like I said, kind of like in the way they did um, Only the Brave, in the way it was like, I will forever remember those guys because of that movie. But it's like here, if you're, if you're not effective like that, then, and you just kind of come off like a derivative of a lot of other movies like this that aren't even remotely this kind of story, um, where it's a, it's a group of characters that should be this close-knit with each other, um, and, the, and it's just, 
yeah, you're just doing the whole thing kind of a disservice, and it just feels very lackluster when that's the absolute last thing. If any kind of military movie was going to be like this big emotional powerhouse, you would think it's a story like this with such a small group of dudes doing something so big and making such an impact. Um, it's really hard to believe what you read in that text before the credits, um, exactly what they accomplished doing this. Um, but it's like, how? what is that? When you watch this movie for two hours and ten minutes and the most effective thing is the closing text. When you're getting the history lesson is when it's its most effective. Um, and like I said, with actors that do the, this, you know, with this caliber, you'd think they could really bring it out, but the, it's nothing that the actors can do because the material just stops at a certain place and they can't really get beyond it because where can they go? Um, especially with playing, I don't know how loosely it's portrayed, but, you know, real people to an extent. Um, and then there are, there are moments, every time there's a moment of suspense, it's a, it's a suspense technique that feels very recycled and like something we've seen a bunch of times before. Um, there is, um, in the di the dialogue's really holding us back to. I was talking about that failed, you know, comedy dialogue, comedy relief dialogue or whatever you want to call it. Um, but there's also moments like when William Fickner lays out the whole thing for them at the beginning for Hemsworth and Shannon, and he goes through the whole thing, who everybody is, what the mission is, how we're going to do this, how we're going to go to this, what's going on here. And then there's like a whole scene when Hemsworth and Shannon go back to the crew and relay that, like the whole thing. <laughs> and it's like, we we didn't need this scene twice. Either don't have the scene with Fickner or don't have the scene where you repeat Fickner. Um, and then just cut to the shit. All right, that's a good, that's... With the way we're racking up runtime here, um, so much can go, and so it would probably be a lot more effective. Um, and it's like, imagine in this movie, at like an hour 40, how like tight and suspenseful and organized and smooth it would feel, and would still be well enough time to get the point across. Or it's like, you could use all this extra time you're doing with bullshit to really flush the characters out. And when I say flush the characters out, I don't mean follow Trevante Rhodes when he goes to take a piss. Um, and then talk about dialogue that just doesn't work or it's really lazy and cliche. Here's something. Uh, when Shannon's getting ready to leave at the beginning, after he's gotten the call, and his wife is upset because he's going to have to leave, and they're talking about their, their son, and so the son hasn't been told yet that he's going to leave, so the wife says, well, you tell him. I'm not going to do your dirty work for you. And she walks away. And I was like, what in the fuck? That is exactly word for word verbatim what Uncle Phil said to Will's dad in that famous episode of Fresh Prince. <laughs> word for word. Like the exact same delivery. The, you tell him, I'm not going to do your dirty work for you as the person is leaving. It's like, well, holy shit. This is <laughs> 12 strong of all movies. <laughs> Has to take dialogue from Fresh Prince because it can't think up original shit to say or original ways to bring out the clearly emotional impact they're trying to make. That's kind of pathetic. So, yes, um, it's like, so, as I was saying, there's like really good movies like this. There's movies like this that really fall short. This is just kind of blandly sitting in the middle, not knowing what to do with itself. Not knowing how to bring about those impacts it really needs to make from any standpoint. And it's like, even even when an extremely major character seems like he's in big danger, it's like, I didn't just, I just didn't feel jack shit watching this. I felt like there was something wrong with me. But then it's like, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's the movie. I certainly hope it's the movie. Because I would not like to think that I am that heartless to these people that did this incredible thing. So, yeah, that's... That's just really unfortunate. This movie just exists, and it used that... I'm trying to figure out how they even got that cast together. Probably the strength of the story itself on paper, but... Yeah, and then they got a um, director whose name I didn't quite recognize. I'm sure if I look him up, he's done something I saw, but his name didn't jump out at me, so... Yeah, it's... it's I don't know. That's So that's what that is. It's just there. So our last movie is going to be The Commuter. 
the next action outing with Liam Neeson, right after he said, I'm retiring from action movies, and then the commuter came out, and he's like, oh, fuck it, I'm gonna keep doing action movies, I don't care. So, <laughs> um, and you'll worth, it's worth noting, I'm sure many of you have noticed, yes, the commuter's poster, it's, it's like, you think, oh, well, Liam Neeson's typecast now, like, it's cool, a guy his age is getting the leads in these action roles and all that, but it's like, still, he's pretty typecast, so it's like, you see the poster for the commuter, and it's like, wow. They took the poster for Taken, you can't see it, that poster for Taken is on my ceiling, where it's black and white, he's facing to the side, and he's got the gun, and it's got the the speech all down it in text in front of him. And it's like, they took this poster, they photoshopped out the gun and put a briefcase in his hand, and put the commuter on it in that train font. There you go. That's what the poster for the commuter is. That's more or less what the commuter is. Because he's reuniting with his director from Unknown, Nonstop, and Run All Night. And, once again, you look at that lineup and you're like, oh, yep, so... We're getting those. Okay. <laughs> um, so we start off with this kind of annoying title sequence. Like, it was off to a bad start early. Um, where it's basically the passage of time. It's like, this is what he does. He goes to work on this train every single day, and then he comes home, and this is his routine. But they show that in the most annoying way possible, cutting back and forth between time frames, as if, for some reason, I don't know. They could and they didn't, it doesn't feel like a certain order or anything. Like, they just jumbled up a lot of poorly edited scenes to show, hey, he does this a lot. So, once that stops bombarding you, the movie begins, um, and of course, he's been doing this for a while, but then it's, he takes up a scene, and he, he sends in his audition tape for Up in the Air, and he gets fired, um, and they give him the package and all that, and so he's gonna, he's gonna be on this train anyway, because he doesn't want to have to tell his wife and kid, you know, hey, I got fired, doesn't that suck? Uh, it's like, I'm like 60, and I got fired, what are we gonna do? Um... And he can't get a retirement plan worked out or anything. So, then, obviously, it kicks right into thriller mode. Not soon enough. It takes its time building up characters to where it's like, Hey, there's Patrick Wilson. Hey, there's Sam Neill. Wow. The direction this movie's going, I kind of feel like we're never going to see Patrick Wilson or Sam Neill again. I wonder if they'll be important later. I don't know. I'll just forget they exist until that happens. So then, after all that, finally, th Thriller Mode kicks in, and then Vera Farmiga sits across from him, and a whole lot of vague, cryptic shit goes down that we can't fucking understand, <laughs> and, and then the movie begins, basically, finally. Um, and so, I, and I don't really know how we're supposed to take this, because movies like this certainly do exist, and have successfully in the past, where they're thrillers that give you as little information as possible, and you're like, ooh, a puzzle, I'll take that, let's try to figure this out. And it's like, oh, we get this tiny little piece of information and this tiny little piece, and we're, we're just blind, we're just going in these directions we're getting pointed to, and we're not sure what's going on, what the objective is, what we're trying to do, and it's disorienting, but it's also really fun in a way where you're trying to solve it all out and like really get to the bottom of this mystery, just as the lead character is, and you're kind of doing this you know, simultaneously. Not at all the feel you get watching this. Where it's kind of like, well, hold on now, all I heard was a bunch of cryptic bullshit that is not adding up to the point that I am so, so incredibly disinterested in how this is going to turn out <laughs> off the bat. Um, so, and, and it's it all kind of happens very quickly, and then Vera Farmiga disappears without a trace. And even Liam Neeson's sitting here going like, what the fuck? What, what, who is this? What was that? Could you repeat that? I don't, what? <laughs> so, basically, he's supposed to find somebody on this train that's not supposed to be on here, but because he's on this train every day, he's got to figure out who doesn't belong. And it's like, we're basically supposed to believe that every single person on this full train every single day is the exact same person. So he's got to do a process of elimination of who doesn't stick, who, who sticks out. And there's like five, he points out five people on the train that haven't been on the train before. 
that's basically the concept. He has to decide which of these five is the person Vera Farmiga wants to kill. Um, and she leaves him $25,000 in cash in the fucking bathroom. <laughs> and so, but, here's the thing. Is I keep saying how preposterous this plot. But you think, maybe you go back and you're like, but dude, didn't you think positively of nonstop? And it's like, well, I didn't think nonstop was any kind of masterpiece. And I actually quite liked the movie nonstop felt like a ripoff of Flight Plan. And these are movies, yes, that have absolutely positively preposterous plots that should make no sense and will completely make... There's no investment whatsoever because you immediately, the first thing you say is, well, this is fucking dumb, and you don't even try to get hyped up in it. You don't give it a chance. But the thing here is that, yes, Nonstop was about as dumb as this, but there was something about that movie. For starters, that was back in 2014. That was four years ago. So it didn't quite feel like... Like, this This really bad concept has been played out a lot since then. It was played out back then, but it's been played out even more since then. And obviously we're totally losing our charm at this point for preposterous plots. Um, don't forget, I'm the guy that thought Grand Piano was one of the best movies of its year. So I am totally willing to forgive a movie if its plot is fucking crazy in a, in a really dumb way. Um, but I mean, this was just, like I said, from the get-go, this was not working for me. Everything just felt completely unintentionally disorienting. I know they were trying to do that to an extent, but it's like, I don't think to the point to where I was saying, I am just so lost right now, but not in a way that it feels like the movie has a plan. That is the best way to disorient the audience, is you feel like you're in good hands if you feel like the movie will ultimately have a point. And all of this will add up to something that makes sense when you look back at it, or at least enough sense. But just from the get-go, I was like, as soon as Vera Farmiga said to do these things, I was like, this movie doesn't know what the fuck it's doing. I guarantee they wrote this as they went. And, <laughs> which means it's so not going to add up to shit. Um, and, yeah, and then just from then on, it's just irritatingly cryptic throughout, to the point that they clearly want to accomplish something that's a big deal, but nobody's going to accomplish jack shit because they're not saying enough to anybody, not to the characters in the movie, certainly not enough to the audience to give a fuck. So, as it goes on, um, it all does become very familiar, kind of very fast. There is the whole, obviously there's the whole confined transportation, like in non-stop, um, and then there, and obviously it's like it's on a train, and there's one objective, and we're always on this train. So it's like, yeah, I'm getting kind of source code vibes here. And then it's like, well, hold on a second. So I've gotten up in the air vibes. I've gotten source code vibes. This movie's from the director of Orphan. Of course, Vera Farmiga's in it. It's like every single thing in this movie connects back to her other movies. Of course. Um, so uh, and the fact that she's attached to the hip with Patrick Wilson. Despite the fact that I don't think they share a scene in this one, still, uh, it's like everything just adds up to her being in this. Despite the fact that they do an amazing actress like her, a complete disservice by the end of the movie when it's just completely... I really didn't want to say off the rails in this review, but there it is. Um, by, by the end of this movie, Vera Farmiga is nothing more than an angry phone. Like, that's what it is. She's an angry voice on a phone after we see her in that first scene. <laughs> and it's like, wow... You just really you fucked over her. Because this seemed like... She probably could have brought more interest in this if you didn't just say, here, sit down, say stupid cryptic shit, and disappear without a trace. She could have made that interesting if you gave her time. Um, and if you maybe tried a little bit more in the script process. But, yeah. Um, so, of course, you know every direction this, this is going to go in. Where it's like, obviously he has to point out who is the outcast here on this train. So, obviously, there's going to be a scene half an hour in when he sees the mysterious person and they're acting real suspicious and they're like, they're doing something that really makes them look guilty. So he's going to chase them and this is our first action scene where the chase is like walking to another car on the train. And then it turns out that, obviously, that person's not the person we're looking for. But we know this because it's been on for half an hour and we've been through this with so many movies before. Why did they? Why do they still try with that? Here's an idea. If you're gonna do that shit half an hour in, completely throw people off and make that the person. 
to where it's like it's gonna be this big mystery that's like an hour forty something, and it's like half an hour in, we know who it is, and it's like holy shit, where does it go from here? Um, but no, we're doing the same old shit where it's like, oh, it's this person, ha. Huh? Of course it's not. Maybe it's that person. No, we haven't reached the hour mark yet. It's obviously not going to be them. Keep trying, Liam Neeson. And that's basically what the movie is until eventually it gets to the point where it's going to be... Um, it's going to get really clumsy as hell and, yeah, eventually turn into an action movie. Kind of the first big um, action scene of the movie here is him trying to get off the train underneath and it's like whoa and it's like well man he got off the train and he survived and then immediately the continuation of this one action scene is him getting back on the train <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of movie we're dealing with um and and obviously this is gonna be one of those movies that has just a lot of those scenes where i was talking about where like it just becomes stupidity overload after a while, to the point where you can't even say, well, maybe I'll just try to have a little fun with it. No, this, like, this is one of those movies that's chock full of those, like, conveniently has, like, the most well-timed and accidentally informative phone call in movie history. And it's... <laughs> some of the scenes get dumber and dumber. I swear to God. Not to say too much, but the scene at the end, the Spartacus scene... And they even, they even try to counter that by adding comedy relief to it. Where it's like, they clearly want it to be this big moment for the movie. But it's like, oh hey, we also want to acknowledge how fucking dumbass it is by having our comedy relief guy say some bullshit. And it's... It's, it's just, no. I mean, there are some moments where it's like... Um, like, every now and then he has a nice Liam Neeson moment. Like, um, like the scene where they're, like, sitting down and playing cards and shit. Or that scene, that non-verbal scene he has with the kid when the kid points out that he has a nosebleed. It's just, like, a nice little moment that lasts, like, maybe five seconds. Doesn't really need to be a whole lot of anything. Um, and it's fine. But, I mean, once it gets into the whole climax of it, that whole convoluted hostage situation, really forced twists, obviously people coming back into the movie that obviously weren't done... Because they were introduced once, and they're a recognizable face. It's, yeah, it's it's kind of a disaster. And it's, like I said, it's it's a bummer because it's one of those movies where you just want to say, you know, I mean, what is this? I mean, what am I really trying to, you know, analyze here? Let's just let this movie be what it is. But, I mean, after a while, it just really feels like it's, like, like they're not even trying. Like, they just saw a bunch of movies before this, and they're just writing that shit down as they go. Not quite sure where their story points are going to come to a head, if they are at all. So, and you got Oscar nominee Elizabeth McGovern, by the way, as Liam Neeson's wife. This is going to be here for, like, a minute and a half, of course. So, <laughs> it's, like, just a lot of waste left and right. So, um, yeah, I, I wish... Like I said, I could have just seen it that way, but um, this is this is just a little too dumb, so that's unfortunate. Um, so until tomorrow, that's what we have for these. But then you'll be getting the um, I'll be watching some of those new Netflix movies like uh, uh, Before I Wake, uh, Jack Black's The Poker King, I think it's called. There's um, I can't remember what that other one is. The one with the kid from Don't Breathe I just talked about. Uh, and then one, I think it's called Stepsisters or something, are the four new ones over the past couple of weeks, starting in January. So I will try to do those consistently, because I saw like almost all the original Netflix movies last year, but I didn't really review any of them, um, just because I just kind of watched them all at once, and that seemed like a big stack. So I just said, I'll just leave that. But um, I will try to do them consistently as they come out. So... There's that. Like, Duncan Jones' new movie, speaking of source code, is going to be released in February through them, so... We have stuff like that to look forward to. Um, so yeah, since we're doing that, I will cut this off as fast as possible, so...